Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host, Paula Farmer. Welcome to Book Passage and what is sure to be, I think, one of our most fun and fascinating Conversations with Authors event. Uh, please take just a minute to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and get some questions ready for our featured authors. I promise they will get to those very soon. Also keep in mind, um, our featured book tonight, Bad Mother F, we forgot to say how we're supposed to address this title. Oh my gosh. Um, we do have book plates for, so signed first editions, my friends. Um, but so we can get started in this. Um, I have personally been looking forward to this event since I laid eyes on this book uh, by Gavin Edwards. As you can see, it's right behind me. And um, I, I don't know about you, but Sam Jackson just immediately brings a smile to my face, or I think of a scene from a movie and I start giggling. So I'm so glad that I actually own this book. I can just take it out and laugh. Um, <laughs> not only is he, he's the embodiment, Samuel Jackson is the embodiment of cool, but his coolness isn't just... Um, it's not just about being cool. It's not just inspirational. It's important. Uh, Bad Mother F lays out how uh, his attitude intersects with his identity as a black man, why being cool matters in this modern world, and how Jackson can guide us through the current cultural movement in which everyone is actually losing their cool. Edwards details uh, Jackson's life both personally and professionally as an A-list movie star, who has had many challenging days and years throughout his life, everything in between the fame and fortune. Um, and it's also kind of a fun book, the way it's set up and the, um, the uh, illustrations and things like that. There's a lot going on here, Gavin. We're so <laughs> fortunate to have you here to talk, break it all down. Oh, thank you. Uh, biographer Gavin Edwards draws on original reporting and interviews the book explores not only the major events of Jackson's life, but also his obsessions. Edwards is a New York Times bestselling author of 13 books, including The Tao of Bill Murray, Kindness and Wonder, Why Mr. Roger Matters Now More Than Ever. He has written magazine covers on Jared Leto, Johnny Depp, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and co-written books with Travis Barker. 
Um, he was an original MTV VJ. He is a veteran of publications such as Rolling Stone and his and the New York Times. His in conversation uh, host or moderator is Douglas Wolf, which everybody probably knows from this book, <laughs> All the Marbles. Uh, but he is an Eisner Award winning reading uh, winning reading comics and the host of the podcast. The Voice of Latveria. I hope I'm saying that right. He has written about comic books, graphic novels, pop music, and technology for the New York Times, Rolling Stones, um, and many, many more publications. Uh, I say this is a perfect pairing. They're friends and they geek out together. So let us join in. Douglas, please take it from here. Thank you so much, Paula. This is fantastic. I'm so glad to get to talk to you, Gavin. So I guess the, the thing at the top of my mind is a super, super nerdy question, which is, it is a writing question. It is the form of this book is not like anything else I can think of, and it's gorgeous, and it's original, and it's fun, and how did that form take its shape? So, um, I sort of, uh, th thank you, and also thank you for uh, being here. Uh, um, so, um, it, uh, this came out probably uh, from a few years back when I wrote about Bill Murray um, and I wrote uh, the Tao of Bill Murray and I knew, you know, I had to like set up a certain amount of like biography uh, in the front. Um, and, uh, but then what I really wanted to write about was like all those crazy, like Bill Murray stories of, you know, sort of he crashes your party, he washes the dishes and then he leaves. And uh, so, uh, and I discovered sort of, you know, I like don't want to say like I invented a new form, but I was kind of like finding my way through it as I did it. And I realized sort of after like, oh, it's, you know, sort of really not a traditional biography because you sort of like the, uh, you know, like I liked this feeling of not hitting like the beat after beat of, and then in 1972, this happened. And then in 1973 was a time of many changes and so on. So, you know, like, uh, uh, and then when I, uh, like, I feel like, uh, that has made it feel like just like livelier for me as a writer uh, that I'm more sort of excited to jump in and say like, okay, I can approach somebody through the things that, you know, sort of like I want to like really like nerd out about like the things they care about and the things they're, they're deeply into. And if you do it right, then it comes through with, like the whole way through down to like the art in the book. So when it came to Samuel Jackson, I was saying, well, you know, sort of what I really deeply uh, care about here is like the work, you know, he's a fascinating guy and I want to get into his life and all these things that happen, but, you know, sort of like he is at his fullest and at his best when he is on screen and he's made 140 movies. And I felt like I had seen a lot of Samuel L. Jackson movies, but not as many as I was going to yeah. see. And so I decided like, you know, one of like my sort of mission statements at the very beginning was I'm going to and write about every single one of these movies. Um, but then I wanted to make sure that it was not just one big, like, indigestible, like, lump at the end of the book of, you know, sort of like, and then it feels like an encyclopedia and it's not fun. And it was about halfway through the process where it was this, like, relatively, it sounds like, simple in retrospect, but it was the thing that unlocked the whole book for me when I said, wait, I could have parts of biography and then I could, you know, alternate it with the movies he was making at the time. And I really liked how that like sort of had the chapters bouncing off of each other. And like, I felt like it uh, made for a nice interplay. Yeah. And then you got the images with them, which is a whole yeah. other thing. Like how did that, how did that happen? Sure. So um, ooh, let's, uh, let's show a few good ones. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, they're all good, so let's see what uh, comes up. Ah, uh, here we go. But here's, uh, whoop, uh, there we go. That's Nicole Gu uh, doing, well, oh, flickering. There we go. Uh, an alternate poster for Unbreakable. So what I did um, was I commissioned uh, 26 different artists um, uh, to do new posters of movies that Samuel Jackson was in. So there's Goodfellas, and uh, we'll do one more. Um, and it was the same thing of, uh, you know, sort of saying, what is it that we sort of like want to see with uh, some ooh, fresh, underrated movie, but an excellent movie. Uh, um, and, 
you know, sort of like I had previously, um, the, you know, the, the altogether brilliant uh, Robert Sikoriak um, uh, with uh, the Bill Murray book had uh, done this thing. Of, I said, OK, the charm of uh, Bill Murray is he pops up everywhere. Like, uh, you know, sort of you hear the story of like all of a sudden he's tending bar at South by Southwest. That's, again, not who Samuel Jackson is like. So what do we really want to like get into? And I said, we want to get into the movies. I don't want to see. Now, like I never like the photo section in a book where it's the uh, you know the, you know here's this person on the red carpet and here they are accepting an award and here's you know sort of like a uh, uh, one uh, screen cap from like one of their most famous roles it feels just like tedious and obvious to me but like this I love you know sort of like uh, sometimes you'll see like shows where people like you know commission art and say like let's just do you know sort of like you know, like original paintings of like about like Captain America. And in this case, I'm like, well, we can do like a gallery show, but like in the book. Uh, so that made me really happy. I actually wanted to ask you, um, um, did Marvel give you a hard time when you wanted to use art uh, in your book? Uh, we ended up deciding to just use stuff that we could use on a fair use basis. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, there, there is no official connection between my book and Marvel. Right. Um, it is neither officially authorized nor officially disauthorized. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I did hey, much like my status. Much Samuel like exa said. exactly, exactly. Um, but uh, the, the the way that ended up going is that uh, I was just on one of the official Marvel podcasts a couple of weeks ago. And I, as I noticed earlier today, this week's issue of Defenders on the last page, Dr. Strange has my book on his bookshelf, which was a, a verklempt kind of moment for me. Uh, you are officially a person in the 616. Mm. I, or at least the book exists in the 616. <laughs> I, 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 I assume it's, a, I assume it's a different version of the book. Uh, how could it not be? Uh, but you, so you were talking about the, the, the official status of, your book vis-a-vis -vis right. Mr. Samuel L. Jackson. Right. So um, I had interviewed him in the past and that was, you know, sort of something I was able to like draw on, like as I did the book. And it was actually one of my favorite interviews ever. And, you know, like my wife has seen me interview hundreds of uh, people where just, you know, it's, it's my job and uh, much as it, it is for uh, you, I imagine. And it's the only time where I got off the phone with somebody where she said, give me the tape right now. <laughs> <laughs> and she sort of like popped it into like her walkman, just sort of sat there listening to it in headphones, you know, sort of like, and just every time, like he says, motherfucker, as he does with some frequency, you know, like it's a source of joy. So um, yeah. Uh, so it was good knowing that, you know, sort of even though you know, I wasn't able to sort of like, uh, you know, get him to walk me through all 140 of his movies, A, he had done a lot of that, uh, you know, sort of like as he made them uh, over the years. And I was able to spend my time with him talking about some of like the core questions about like who he was and like why he does what he does. So, And you talked to a bunch of other people. Absolutely. Um, I talked with um, the people he had worked with. My favorite people that I got in touch with were people who knew him uh, like sort of like before like things took off. So, you know, sort of talking to people who like worked with him like uh, in the Atlanta theater scene or like were in a, you know, sort of like uh, plays with him like at the public theater and uh, were able to speak to like what that was like. Uh, so, you know, there's a point where he was just like a striving actor and he was good and he was talented, but, you know, nobody said that guy, he's going to be, you know, like, you know, the world's biggest star. <laughs> So what what gave him that drive to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and taking so many roles and investing so much of himself in sure. so many roles? So, I mean, the taking so many roles, I think a huge part of it is just um, he loves to work and he loves to get out of the house. Uh, yeah. That, you know, sort of like <laughs> – so you may know that he's uh, – depending on uh, – uh, that. Uh, of all the, uh, Stan Lee actually has this record, but he's not a movie star. But it, it, uh, <laughs> so Samuel L. Jackson is the movie star whose uh, movies have the uh, highest cumulative box office ever. Uh, wow. So Stan Lee's cameos uh, for every single MCU add up to slightly <laughs> more. But um, uh, so 
Um, and, you know, it's aside from making like uh, 13 like MCU movies, uh, he's uh, he was in the Star Wars prequels and even like, you know, sort of he's in Jurassic Park and it all just sort of like has added up to an extraordinary number of movies because, you know, like many years he'll make like five movies. And so one of the things is he loves to work um, and uh, he says, you know, sort of most people, like if they take a couple of like weeks off a year, you know, sort of nobody says like, oh, they're a workaholic, you know, sort of like what I want to do is act. And anytime I get a chance to act, I am happy to act. And he's also very low ego about, uh, you know, sort of it doesn't matter to him that much, whether he's like the leading man or he's happy to come in and play a supporting role. So uh, for an actor of his stature, he's unusually willing to say, sure, like, you want me for one scene? Like, I am there, you know, sort of like three days of work, let's do it. (laughs) Right. Um, So you ended up watching 140 movies for this. Yes. What was, what was the process? Like, what was your, (laughs) was it the Groundhog Day kind of situation? Like, (laughs) I mean, there's always that feeling of there's more movies to watch, right? Uh, So, uh, I mean, the biggest thing is just you have to, like, commit early and say like you know if you leave them all for the last three weeks you're in trouble right Right. so uh and just uh but you know i knew i had about a year to do this uh and it was a so there was just like a lot of the day where like you know like four or five nights a week i'm watching a samuel jackson movie um and two things really helped one is that he's made such like a wide range of movies um that you know there's um, the things like Eve's Bayou, uh, where it's, you know, sort of like, you know, sort of like a, a dreamy, like sort of Southern Gothic. And then there's, you know, like various action movies, there's comedies, and some of the movies are great and some are stinkers, but it all kind of like balances out. Um, and then I think the other thing that really just sort of helped me with it was like, I started working on it around the time, like the pandemic began and like lockdown began. And so wow. A, not a lot of going out, but B, in a time when just like the world is upside down and, you know, sort of like everything felt, you know, from day to day, nobody knew what was going on. There was just this real, you know, sort of like comfort and solace and saying, I am going to, you know, sort of like do my job today. I'm going to work on this book and I am going to watch a Samuel Jackson movie. And even in the bad ones, he is going to be showing up and doing something like interesting and special. And like, it was this sort of feeling of like, It was always good to see him and it was always just inspiring to feel like, you know, here is a guy like he is doing his job, Uh, you know, sort of like, you know, he's thought about this. He's not phoning it in, even like in a movie where no one would care if he phoned it in. Uh, So uh, like uh, that was actually hugely helpful. Um, I I, I have to turn it around for you as well. I mean, so you read (laughs) 27,000 comic books. Like how did you, pace yourself um so i initially thought like oh this will take like a year year and a half to read them no no it did not um i thought at first like okay i'm a fast reader i can really commit to this i can read a hundred issues a day wow a hundred issues no i could not read that like i could read a hundred issues on a good day (laughs) not every day is a good day yeah, there's lots of bad days. Um, <laughs> there, and at a certain point, it was just like, I can't take any more for color violence. <laughs> uh, and so I would I would, you know, um, I didn't read I didn't read an order I grazed. Uh, yeah. I read whatever I felt like reading on any given day. So I'd, you know, I'd read some Iron Man, then I'd read some old romance comics, then I'd read some stuff that had Fin Fang Foom in it, then I'd read some stuff that had you know a particular writer or artist. I'd like to j- jump around a lot, but um, it still did eat my life and, uh, I did most of the reading pre pandemic, but I didn't go out a lot for a few years before the pandemic hit. Did you have to cut out most other reading from your like, diet? I did. It was not a balanced diet. I have a big shelf of fiction and nonfiction that I am only now starting to catch up on. And, uh, and it did at a certain point feel like I was uh, gorging myself on not just candy, but like raspberry candy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, you know, it was my job. Yeah. And I kept going. And eventually, you know, Stockholm Syndrome set in and uh, I was able to like – find something to like in even really, really bad comics. I mean, I, I imagine like at a certain point you're like, okay, this is the fifth 
Samuel Jackson movie this week. What will this one have for me? Right. right. And, uh, you know, but part of it is, yeah, like, as you say, even the, in the times when they're not good, there's something about just like the focus of in it uh, that, you know, sort of like, you know, it, you have to like the way you engage with the work is by engaging with the work and, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, sort of you can sure you could skip around, uh, but it's not the same thing that, you know, sort of like the parts that are, you know, sort of like make you twitchy and painful. You need to sort of like, well, why didn't I like that one? You know, sort of like, what is it about my reaction or like, you know, and then when you see, uh, you know, sort of like, oh, and, uh, you know, sort of like he made these two movies in the same year and one's wonderful and one's not. And, you know, but like it's uh, you get like a sense of like the whole flow of things that you can't do any other way. Mm. I mean, did you go to other movies as a palate cleanser? Um, we were um, – the palate cleanser um, was uh, my son, who was, I think, uh, 11 at the time, um, the, wanted to – got interested in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So as a family, we did a Buffy rewatch. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah, and so that was nice because it was sort of like short, uh, you know, like it's, you know, like 45 minutes. Like, okay, I can do that, and then I can go watch a movie. So it felt like I had something that, like, was a counterpoint as it went along. Are there movies that were – well – are there movies that were particularly hard to track down that you knew existed, but that? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, there was, <laughs> um, there was one that I never was able to um, uh, find, um, uh, which was um, uh, directed by. It was his very first movie in the early 1970s in Atlanta, uh, directed by um, uh, Michael Schultz, I believe. He did uh, Car Wash, uh, and, uh, like a bunch of uh, Richard Pryor movies. And it was out for a few weeks then. It's never been out on video anywhere. I, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, I, uh, you know, sort of worked every single angle I could, uh, to find it. And it's just, it's, uh, it's gone. Uh, you know, like, I think it's never going to emerge. Uh, so of the others, there was a few that um, uh, just sort of like never streamed or never even made it to like digital video. The one that immediately comes to mind uh, was uh, something called Fathers and Sons. Um, which is um, the uh, Jeff Goldblum vehicle that also uh, like has like a cast including like Famke Jansen, and Michael Imperioli, no. and um, and it's a drama about this um, the successful movie writer director who's sort of like given it all up and like uh, gone down to like the Jersey Shore to live a like domestic life. Oh, and Rosanna Arquette is in it. She's like wow. plays like a, a fortune uh, teller like on the boardwalk in Asbury Park, and she's like has no connection at all to the rest of the movie, but because it's Roseanne Arquette, they didn't cut her out. And, you know, so, wow. and it's not a good movie, but, you know, sort of it's this fascinating artifact of, you know, sort of like, it's this, in, uh, like I it was done, I'm sure for a relatively low budget and, you know, like it made it onto VHS um, and, you know, sort of like I had to track that down. There was also a um, movie, uh, Oh, I'm, I'm spacing on the name of it now. Um, the, it was set in prison, um, um, and uh, um, uh, Samuel Jackson has one scene in it, um, the, but it was a great scene uh, where it's sort of like he's a prisoner who's like being taken, like you know, like it's his day to die, uh, like he's about to be executed, and you know he's sort of like wants to walk and wants to have his dignity, but in fact he can't, and his body collapses, and it gives it this like real like jolt that the like, uh, the movie needed. So, uh, but there was nothing more obscure than VHS, but there is something about, you know, sort of like trolling around for these movies that, you know, sort of like nobody even wants to scream. Uh, they, you know, sort of like finding like the cultural, like the treatise, uh, you know, sort of like uh, they're out there and like God bless eBay, but you got to work to find them. Yeah. Um, are there things that he did that are like, you know, TV episodes or stuff like that? Or did he pretty much bypass TV. He's pretty much bypassed. Like, there's like a few uh, like TV shows he's made like cameos on. You know, sort of like, um, and obviously like uh, Agents of Shield would be one of them. It was there a couple of times. Um, uh, there's an uh, um, uh, uh, there's an HBO show. Um, uh, he uh, like he he basically cameos on TV shows. Uh, so um, uh, there's nothing that's been like sort of like a real body of work the thing i would have loved to have seen was more of his theater and of course like that's the nature of theater it's ephemeral right. ah extras is the name of the hbo show I'm not, oh, okay yes uh, um and uh he uh, you know sort of 
it's just uh, uh, you know fascinating even to discover like the plays that like existed that you know like oh here he was in like a play he did in Baltimore that's like set in the uh, locker room of a uh, basketball team at halftime and uh, you know sort of like it sounds great I'd love to see it but it's gone <laughs> so. Uh, and actually, you mentioned the book, uh, the Amazing Cosby Show connection, which I did not know about. Yes, so he story. was Samuel Jackson uh, was Bill Cosby's stand-in for a couple of years on the Cosby Show, uh, and so uh, for those who don't know, like uh, that means basically um, uh, they show up at the beginning of the week, like they do a table read, um, and then uh, the cast like sort of goes off and does uh, their thing, and uh, the crew spends a couple of days like getting ready to film the episode. And to do that, they need actors to sort of stand in the places where the actor is, uh, where the actual actors are going to be. So they say, oh, we're moving the camera around and then we come in tight on this person. And so um, uh, uh, Samuel Jackson, uh, like, was Bill Cosby stand in. So he would wear the causes, you know, sort of like wardrobe <laughs> over his because apparently like, as large as Samuel Jackson is, apparently Bill Cosby is a larger man than him. Um, and he did this, uh, he said, never wanted to be on the show uh, like he never like lobbied like hey will you give me a bit um uh, but he just sort of was treating it as like an introductory class and, like sort of sitcom like okay i'm getting paid to be here and i'll learn how multi-camera shows work and i'm gonna get something out of it so and then i did it for a while and then i guess he just kind of like wandered off the uh, the kicker <laughs> to the story um, was that, you know, sort of about five years, some years later, like a few years after he got famous, he ran into Cosby, like at a, uh, a Knicks game, I think. And uh, Cosby sort of recognized him, even though they'd never really had a conversation before, but he knew who he was. It's like, Sam, are you working? I need a stand in. <laughs> nice. That's wow. So how many of the movies had you seen before you started working on this? I mean, clearly you had to watch them all again because you had to tabulate the number of expletives in each one. Yes. So oh, um, I watched everything again, even if I had seen it, like, aside from that. I wanted to have, like, sort of, like, a fresh experience with it. i count, but I would say 30, maybe 40, uh, you know, sort of, like, which feels like a, you know, for many actors, that's a complete body of work, right? Uh, right. Um, but I, uh, you know, sort of, at a certain point, I realized that I needed to um, watch the movies just to watch the movies and not try to like take too many notes on them as they were happening. And so I would uh, then, you know, sort of like the next day, like go through and like tabulate all, like early on I decided, you know, this is going to be added value. I think okay. people need to know, you know, like exactly, you know, like how much cussing there is in any uh, given Sam Jackson movie. And so I would be going through a scene and, you know, sort of like I have like a list of the, of the things I designated as curse words and I'm doing hash marks and I'm pausing and I'm rewinding. And it takes a while because you know, I want to get it right. <laughs> and as I'm doing it, like I would always be like this self, I have a very weird job. I have a very weird job. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were watching movies, were there, were there any that were really surprising to you or really like kind of unlocked insight into some of the other ones? Yeah. Um, I was, I mean, one of the fascinating things to discover was, uh, you know, sort of like, and it's not just the like wandered into them, but it's really interesting now to see him uh, with really small appearances in movies that turned out to be just like stone cold classics uh, that, you know, sort of like he's in Goodfellas. <laughs> Um, and, you know, sort of he's got a couple of scenes uh, and then, you know, he gets like shot in the back of the head and like, you know, and he's gone. For those of you who don't remember, he is uh, Stax, who's one of the guys in like uh, the Lufthansa um, uh, heist and he forgets to uh, get rid of the uh, getaway car. And so like they find it on a street somewhere. And so like that's the end of Stax. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of like and delving into that, you can see, you know, sort of like the character who's not really part of the gang, like, and that sort of mirrors like Jackson's status as not part of like the core group of, you know, sort of like, you know, Pesci and De Niro and so on. But like, he's talked about uh, like making that movie. He didn't get to talk to Robert De Niro, just like De Niro's, like, you know, you're on this side of the set, you, you know, De Niro's there, you, like you don't walk up to him and have a conversation. Um, and then, you know, sort of like they make Jackie Brown a few years later and, you know, they're best friends and it's a very different uh, environment. Uh, but he's sort of like, you know, had both sides of that. 
Um, another one that I had completely forgotten how wonderful it was, was, uh, and I don't know how long it's been since you've seen it, is uh, Out of Sight. Uh, I've never seen it. Oh, my God. Treat yourself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the, the moment when, you know, sort of like everything uh, clicked for Soderbergh. Um, and I think wow. it is, you know, so it's almost certainly Jennifer Lopez's uh, best movie. And I could uh, uh, make an argument. Uh, as, I, I think it's my favorite George Clooney movie. It's just like a lot of things just come together and, uh, you know, like it is an almost perfect confection and like just like a murderer's row of like Albert Brooks and Sheetle, like all these great, great people, like all bringing like their A-plus game. And at the very end of it, um, in the uh, final scene, the, there's an uncredited Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, you know, sort of like, uh, just like, you know, he's the thing that like gives the movie like the final twist that it needs. Wow. Yeah. That's... And that's, that's you know, sort of like, at, it was, he was beginning to be a star, you know, sort of like, you know, it was post Pulp Fiction, you know, sort of like there was... A, and, uh, it's like him showing up in a movie in a full awareness of the gravity that he brings by being there. And it's one of the first moments where you can see him of, with this awareness of, oh, it turns out that I'm not just an actor. I'm like a movie star and I have a persona and, you know, sort of like and the, figuring out how you can like deploy that strategically. And so that was a really interesting movie to rewatch. Like I'd seen it and loved it back in the day, but not thought about it since and seeing like, a, it's aged incredibly well, and now B, it feels very different, like in his like corpus of work. Mm. Yeah, and what what he and Soderbergh and Tarantino and Spike Lee have in common is they're yeah. all total movie nerds. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that come that comes through so much in so much of Jackson's stuff. You can see like he he is the person who like goes home and certain like finds out some some new like Korean movie subgenre and like you know, yeah. needs to know no, everything I mean, about it. Like yeah. uh, so I interviewed uh, Tarantino some years ago and it was going yeah. fine. He's being professional and then mm-hmm. Um, uh, I asked him what he was watching. He was talking about, you know, sort of like, uh, oh, these different like horror movies. And there was this one that was uh, great because it was like set in a uh, like depressed small town in Canada, but it wasn't masking it as something else. It was actually showing like, oh, this is an economically depressed small town in Canada. I'm like, oh, it's kind of like Slapshot. And then his eyes lit up like I had returned serve. It's like, oh, somebody is like, even if it's for just a minute, someone else is ta- like nerding out on movies with me. And that was like the Bond that he and uh, Jackson had that, you know, sort of Tarantino like walks by his trailer and hears, you know, sort of like the sound effects of Hong Kong movies and like mm-hmm. what's going on in there. And, you know, sort of like, you know, he'd already cast him, they were working together, but that was when they became friends when they discovered that like they had that. And so. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, th- and through all this, like he's, he's a lot of different kinds of nerd. Like he's a comics nerd. He goes to Golden Apple. In, yes. Like that, yes. that was his uh, comics choice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he is absolutely, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, which is part of the joy of, like, him being in the MCU. Uh, so so you, you have to tell the story of how he ended up being Nick Fury because it's an amazing story. Okay, and and then we need to, like, uh, geek out about Nick Fury for a Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, uh, these, the deal is, um, uh, this is um, the, the, the early... Uh, thousands um you know sort of it's not like marvel's uh, you know sort of like a uh, best uh, time but they've got a new um, uh, comics line um uh, called uh, the ultimates um uh, where they are rebooting a lot of their uh, comics uh, you know this if i'm saying this for other people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um uh, and correct me if i'm getting anything wrong as i go along because uh, um but um, the, they said, like, what if we sort of did the story of, say, Spider-Man from the beginning? We don't have to worry about the continuity and, you know, we can sort of, like, do Spider-Man's greatest hits, but, like, bring it up to date and, like, hopefully, like, let a new audience, like, be in on the story from the beginning. Um, and so that gave them a chance to, like, reboot things. And they also said, like, uh, we can, like, remix things as we go along, um, you know, sort of, and, like, start having some, uh, take the stories in some different directions. And uh, one of the things, there's no Avengers in the Ultimate uh, Marvel, I believe, uh, but they instead, the, 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 first. the Ultimates. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Ultimates, yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, at a certain point when they introduce um, uh, Nick Fury, um, uh, they said, well, like here, like he's a black guy. Uh, and, you know, sort of like uh, writer uh, Mark Miller said, you know, sort of he's like, well, Colin Powell had the equivalent job of, you know, sort of like the head of uh, being in charge of like defense and what would be shield. So like, 
why not here? Um, and uh, because they were huge Samuel Jackson fans, they said, we'll make him look just like Samuel Jackson. So Samuel Jackson is actually at Golden Apple in Los Angeles. And he's flipping through it. He comes to this and he sees himself on the page and he's a little confused. He's like, well, that's me. Did I give permission for this? I don't remember, but you know, he's a busy. So he calls up his agents, find out what's going on. And so they call up and, you know, sort of the agents being agents are saying, well, you know, like you really need to compensate Mr. Jackson for this. And what Marvel comes back with is like, look, we'd really rather not pay him. But how about if we ever make, you know, sort of like a movie that involves Nick Fury, we'll cast him as that. And that was an entirely satisfactory solution, uh, you know, sort of even though at that point it was like monopoly money. Like there was no sense that there were any movies coming down the pike at any point. So it was like an easy way to buy him off. But fast forward seven years and, you know, sort of like, you know, in fact, they say we do want Nick Fury in this first Iron Man movie. And oh, yeah, we did promise Samuel L. Jackson we could do a lot worse than actually have it be him. <laughs> and, and it's just uh, a little cameo piece. Like it's yeah. just, he comes in for the last two minutes of the movie. He comes in for the last 30 seconds of the movie. <laughs> yeah. It is, you know, sort of like less time than like a Capital One ad. Uh, and so, like, he comes in and, you know, sort of like, you know, he sort of like tells Tony Stark, you're not the only uh, hero out there. You know, I'm going to tell you about the Avengers initiative. And it is really just like Marvel, like laying down this marker saying, we're going to make more movies and they're going to be cool. At a point where they didn't know that was true, but yeah. just, you know, sort of like, but, you know, Samuel Jackson tells you that and you're like, all right, I believe yeah. it. You know, like yeah. these movies are going to be cool. <laughs> so uh, and uh, uh, the other thing that like happened as a result is that he became such the iconic version of uh, Nick Fury that now in like regular like Marvel continuity, uh, it's Nick Fury Jr. who is Nick Fury's son and who is also dark skinned and looks, you know, like is bald and looks quite a bit like Samuel L. Jackson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is amazing. And yeah. Great. And and then Jackson just keeps showing up in the Marvel movies. Yeah, I mean, like, at a certain point, like, they said, we really, like, love him being here, and he always comes in, like, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, like, there's a lot of movies where he just shows up, he gives, like, a little, like, blast of, like, gravitas and presence, you know, he can sort of, you know, uh, he's somebody who can, like, t dress down Robert Downey Jr. in a way where you're like, yeah, this guy, like, has the authority to do this, and then, you know, eventually they let him you know sort of like kick ass in captain america the winter soldier and it's uh, like a great thing like all right he's in a car chase he's getting to do things uh, i realized i was thinking about this today that you know sort of like the one uh, big part of um the like nick fury mythos that they don't get into is there aren't really life model decoys right right <laughs> which is kind of like the big nick fury thing like he's yeah. always got like you know these like life-size robots of, of themselves which, um, you know, like the continuing train of thought was it's him and uh, Dr. Doom who do this. Like yeah. uh, the two people like in the Marvel universe, uh, in, like Marvel comics who are into having robots of themselves. Yes. Uh, yeah. Very, very much so. But the MCU version does have scrolls, And it's so true. we get that, that amazing thing in Spider-Man movie where you get Samuel Jackson playing somebody playing him. Yes. And, you know, sort of, and he's very, it's just, little off in a way that you know is not obvious the first time through uh but then you know like you watch it again like oh yeah like and uh i realized this is the work of somebody who has spent decades having people come up to him and quote him like you know the royale with cheese monologue you know <laughs> right. sort of like if you're samuel jackson most days of the week you hear somebody doing an impression of you yeah so do you have a favorite the uh, 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 run or two of like Nick Fury in the comics. Nick Fury in the comics. I mean, Steranko, I assume. St Steranko, yeah, but I actually really, really love that James Robinson and Aiko miniseries from a couple of years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, where they essentially came in and did a tribute to Jim Steranko's kind of classic, beautifully designed mm -hmm. Nick Fury stories from the 60s. With the new Nick Fury, with with his son, with the Sam Jackson lookalike, right? Uh, and they are design first, mm -hmm. like they are not character pieces; they are design pieces. Yes, they mm -hmm. are really, really lovely looking. Uh -huh. um, like Nick Fury is a character you can only really go so far with somebody who is gruff and hyper competent and has really nothing else to him. Yeah. yeah. Um. 
he was like the original Nick Fury was in Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. It was like his unit in World War II. Uh, and that series ran for ages. That started in like 1963 or 64 and went into reruns basically in the 70s. And, and did he have fin- the eye patch in the war or did that come uh, later? The eye patch came later. Okay. Um, when Jack Kirby was designing, uh, the feature that became Nick Fury Agent Shield, it was a thing called The Man Called D E A T H. <laughs> because acronyms were really, really big for spy comics. And he had this like eye patched character. And at some point in the development, like after he'd drawn a couple pages of this already, someone realized, like, oh, this is 20 years. This could be Nick Fury. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so. You had running simultaneously for a while, like an eye patch Nick Fury in World War II with the Howling Commandos right. and Nick Fury, Agent of Shield, um, which was the, the I Spy slash <clears throat> 007 slash every other spy series. Or Man Uncle. Flint, et cetera. Yes. Man from Uncle, Man from Uncle, very much, yes, very much, right. Man from mm-hmm. Uncle, um, which ran Strange Tales for a while, then became its own series ran 15 issues and collapsed. And actually, Nick Fury gets assassinated in the last issue. Really? While attending a Country Joe and the Fish concert. (laughs) (laughs) For real. Um, And then, of course, like two months later, they find Ben Avengers. And they're like, it was a life model decoy, because it's always a life model decoy, because that's Nick Fury's whole thing. Um, (laughs) But no, the... um, there were a number of appearances of Country Joe and the Fish uh, around that time in Marvel Comics. I, I think, like, somebody there was friends with the band. Okay, that would make sense. Yeah. Well, what was the uh, other band in, like, uh, the 80s, 90s? That's, uh, was it Hypno Love Wheel? Or? Love Wheel, yeah. Uh, Dan yeah. Cuddy uh, from Hypno Love Wheel was uh, an assistant editor at Marvel. Uh, but there was this running joke in Spider-Man comics, especially because he worked on the Spider-Man line. The Hypno Love Wheel were this massive and incredibly popular band that, like, you would have to stand in line for hours to get tickets to their shows. And like, I mean, it was Flash Thompson would be like, "I managed to get two tickets to the Hypno Love Wheel show." <laughs> 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 so, I mean, the a, band. Yeah. <laughs> so touching on what you were saying. Uh, you know, sort of like the gruff uh, hyper confidence of Nick Fury, like it makes it, you know, sort of it works as the center of, you know, like these incredibly designed pages. Yeah. Um, and it also works when you have like Samuel Jackson happening. Like, right. you know, the MCU movies give you no sense of, you know, like his interior life. Right. Um, but, you know, sort of like it is this blast of, you know, sort of like every single time it's Samuel Jackson on screen and you are happy to see him because like it is catered to like doing the things that like people love to see him do except curse. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and which he almost gets to do at the end of infinity war. Almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> oh, he has a couple of near. So yeah, like, yeah. uh, you know, sort of as he, uh, dematerializes, there's the mother and yeah. he also in, uh, Captain Marvel gets to say mother flurkin. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, but yeah, he's he is an ensemble player, and yeah. that's something like you rarely get to see Samuel Jackson as an unalloyed lead character of a movie. He can be the most interesting character in a movie when he's part yeah. of an ensemble, and he's that a lot. Yes. Like he he steals the movie like even when he's when he's doing ensemble playing just because he's so good. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are not a lot of movies where he is just the protagonist and it's just about him. Yeah. I mean, I can certainly like name some, uh, but you know, sort of, it's definitely, you know, like uh, so often it's like, uh, you know, there's lots of two handers from like sort of like uh, Pulp Fiction to like Long Kiss Goodnight. Um, uh, but you know, sort of, uh, I think the first one that they, uh, really hyped as, you know, Samuel Jackson is starring was like one eight seven where he's playing like an inner city, uh, teacher. And, uh, so, you know, like he's, uh, you know, enough of a draw that like uh, these movies exist, but I mean, part of the reason there's so many Samuel Jackson movies is because he doesn't insist on that, which is actually the difference between his career and like Lawrence Fishburne's. Um, the, like early on, there was all these, um, uh, parts that, you know, sort of like Lawrence Fishburne's agents told him, don't take this. You need to be the guy, you know, sort of like uh, above, uh, like sort of like uh, the title. And so, you know, so like Samuel Jackson, 
you know, like uh, gets uh, the role in uh, Do the Right Thing uh, when uh, Lawrence Fishburne uh, drops out. He gets uh, the role in uh, Pulp Fiction when uh, Fishburne uh, turns it down. You know, sort of like uh, he elbows his way into uh, the, um, the the third Die Hard movie. So, um, you know, like there was just a lot of work uh, that happened uh, at a point where Fishburne was more concerned about being that guy and Jackson just didn't give a toss. Mm. Yeah, um, but you also see, like, one of the special things about his acting is how much he plays it to the people he is acting with. Yes. No, I think that's absolutely uh, true. And one of the things I found really interesting about, like, his method of preparation is, you know, he shows up with, like, everyone's lines memorized. Like, you know, he's, uh, you know, he knows your lines better than you do. And it's, like, very intimidating for people. But he never says them out loud until he gets there. He's gone through, you know, he's sort of like he's figured out like, you know, his performance, he's made a lot of choices, you know, he sort of knows the interior life of his character, he's got page after page of notes of like who this person is and where they're going and what they're doing, Um, but he absolutely, uh, you know, sort of doesn't like to say it out loud because he wants to, he knows it's going to feel different with, you know, sort of like the acoustics of the room and with the person that he's talking to and how it plays. And so that's what like sort of like makes it not just like a canned performance when he shows up and like gives it, you know, some like, you know, life in the moment. Interesting. Wow. So someone has asked in uh, the, the comments, what, what's your favorite Sam Jackson movie? Well, and, um, and, and uh, actually distinct from what's your favorite Sam Jackson movie and your favorite Samuel Jackson performance? In fact, like they are one and the same, which okay. is uh, Pulp Fiction. Okay. Uh, that, you know, sort of like, uh, I think, and that is the movie that, you know, sort of like established, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, he's done, he had done great work before then, you know, sort of like, uh, uh, not least um, in uh, uh, Jungle Fever, uh, which where he won, you know, sort of like um, an award at Cannes uh, for uh, playing a uh, gator who was um, uh, the, the crackhead in the family. But that was the movie where it was just like, it was this full blast of, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, sort of like terrifying and funny and charismatic and ever uh, like, and it was just this perfect fusion of, you know, sort of like actor and director and dialogue. And it really, you know, sort of that was like laid out uh, the groundwork of, you know, like who his persona was. And, you know, like, I think for a lot of people, that's when like they fell in love with Samuel L. Jackson and he's done Great work before and great work uh, since, but that is still my favorite. Mm. One thing I thought was really interesting in your book is after Pulp Fiction comes out, how many of his movies have callbacks to it? Yes. uh, Like, and uh, just, it is far and away, like, uh, unlike any of his other movies uh, that, you know, sort of like off the top of my head, um, uh, there's, uh, you know, sort of like, there's a uh, lookalike of uh, John Travolta in The Great White Hype. There's a briefcase. Uh, uh, there's briefcase jokes all over the place. Um, uh, uh, one of them is in the, the Astro Boy movie, where there's like these robots open up a, a glowing briefcase and they're like, oh look, there's a flashlight in here. Um, uh, this uh, gravestone when he fakes his own death in uh, the MCU um, it has the quote, uh, "The path of the righteous man" uh, in it. So. Um, the, uh, there's, uh, even when he was in, uh, that, uh, Saw spinoff, Spiral, uh, like, um, uh, there's, um, uh, like a vault in it that has, uh, the name of, um, uh, I think it's like Jules and Vincent Safe Company. Wow. Um, so, uh, and, you know, like, uh, this is, you just have to say, like, the filmmaker's way, uh, that, you know, sort of like, it's a nice little, like, Easter egg for fans who notice, but, you know, like, the reason they want to put those Easter eggs in there is there's all these directors and directed directors who imprinted on, you know, sort of like, uh, the Pulp Fiction in the same way that I did, they were just sort of like, at the right age, it, like, blew the top of their heads off. Mm. Wow. Mm. I'm curious if there, if there are movies that you encounter for the first time in the process of working on this book that really, really surprised you. The one, uh, I mean, that really, uh, like one of my very favorite Samuel Jackson performances, a movie I never would have seen otherwise, is something called Resurrecting the Champ. Okay. Um, and uh, it's not a great movie, which is why, you know, um, uh, it's based on a wonderful, wonderful magazine article um, by, a, I'm going to mispronounce his name, J.R. Moringer, um, who wrote uh, for the LA Times. Um, and um, it's uh, so based on this uh, true story 
from a, uh, a writer um, encountering uh, a homeless guy um, who's a uh, former boxing champion. Um, so, um, and then, you know, sort of like uh, the problem uh, with the movie is that it's got sort of like Josh Harnett as this sort of like, you know, like a young sports writer at like a Denver newspaper. And the movie becomes about like him and his ethical dilemmas when in fact the guy you care about is, you know, like the focus is all wrong. It shouldn't be on the guy who's discovering him and it should be on this character. But Samuel Jackson gives this a astonishing performance like as this like broken down boxer and he's got this wheezing voice and that like makes you want to like sort of lean in and listen closer to it and he's got this like sort of like punch trunk gait and like the way he like moves around is just this wholly like absorbing performance and you know it is uh, you know just him at the very top of his game um uh, you know sort of doing a lot of stuff that if it goes wrong it goes real wrong uh, but in fact you know sort of like every single minute you just like you want to see like more of him and uh, and it ends up I don't want to give away like every sort of twist and turn of it um, but as you find out that some of the things he's saying is true and some are not and as it unfolds like you know sort of like you know there are like enough layers in who he is and how like Jackson is presenting him that like every single uh, uh, part of it you know feels fully realized so that is a movie, never ever, like I don't think I'd even heard of it before I started huh. the, the book, and the and that was sort of like a, a great discovery of him doing wonderful work, uh, you know, sort of even if the, like what's around like doesn't live up to it. Yeah. Uh, got a couple of uh, questions that have been coming in the chat. Um, Paula asks, is it true that Sam origin was originally supposed to get the Ving Rhames part in Pulp Fiction, but lobbied for the part of Jules, and if so, why was he convinced Jules was for him? Um, so he, uh, that is, um, uh, not true. He originally auditioned for, um, a role in, uh, Reservoir Dogs. Um, and the audition went terribly, uh, that, you know, sort of like, um, uh, you know, sort of, he was reading with, uh, Tarantino and the producer Lawrence Bender, and they were just kind of goofing around and cracking each other up. And so he said, like, they were so not good as actors that he was kind of overacting to compensate and he didn't get the role. Um, so you know, go forward, you know, sort of like a year or so. Um, the, there's like the first screenings. He walks up to the Quentin, reintroduces himself. He's like, oh yeah, I remember you, you know, like, a, and since I'm actually writing a part for you right now, uh, which was not a hundred percent true. He was more thinking of Lawrence Fishburne, but he also kind of had in his head that like, if Fishburne doesn't work out, maybe it's going to be Jackson. So, um, and, uh, and then um, he sends him the script, um, you know, like uh, Jackson reads it, says, I can't believe I just read that, reads it again, you know, says like, okay, yes, it's as good as I think it is, immediately accepts the role. Um, and then the actor um, the, who uh, uh, ends up, uh, he, it turns out that he had to audition for it one last time, um, uh, uh, sort of like because the actor who ends up playing uh, the bartender, uh, English Dan, uh, came in and gave a great performance. And they're like, well, maybe we want this other guy. And so Jackson gave this incredibly just like pissed off, like righteous, like read through of it with like, he actually had like a milkshake in one hand and, you know, sort of like a cheeseburger in the other. And at the end, they're like, oh, yes, this is like what it's supposed to be. And, and that was the beginning of one of his like the two great collaborations with a director, the other being with Spike Lee. Mm. Wow. Yeah. We also have a question about snakes on a plane, uh, which is essentially how does he feel and how do you feel about that movie being the punchline of so many jokes? He, uh, I think he and I both feel the same way, which is like, that's great. That's what that movie is made yeah. for. Right. You know, like I actually like spoke with him about this um, uh, and, you know, sort of, he said that, you know, like he, he took the movie, you know, like, and he shows up and uh, then say, well, we're thinking about it. Like we're noodling with it. We might just call it Pacific flight 151. He's like, no, <laughs> I took this movie because it's called snakes on a plane. You know, sort of like, you don't need to run a focus group, you know, sort of like, you know, you know what you were getting. The movie delivers it, you know, just like, this is what it is. He also, uh, you know, sort of said that, uh, you know, sort of like the most famous, um, you know, sort of like a uh, line in the movie. I've had it with these like motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane. Um, they didn't do that the first time around. He said he actually like <laughs> pitched that line to them, you know, and they're like, no, no, it's going to be like a PG movie. And then when, uh, you know, sort of before the movie came out and fans started like uh, cutting, to, uh, there was like 
its own like sort of trailer that like um, amped up the Samuel Jacksonness of it all. Like this is what the movie's going to be, and then they're like, oh yes, I guess this does have to be in it. So yeah, he was full in for the ridiculousness of that movie, and I think like that delights. <laughs> Do you get a sense that that there's any kind of role that he would want to play and has not gotten to play yet? He always used to say that he really wanted to um, uh, be in a Western, um, uh, that, you know, sort of like the the parts he really wants to play are the ones like he grew up watching, you know, sort of like, you know, like he grew up in, you know, sort of like segregated Chattanooga, Tennessee, and every Saturday he would spend, you know, sort of like at the movie theater, one of like two black movie theaters in town. And so, you know, he's watching like sort of like Westerns and cartoons and newsreels, like the whole like old fashioned full day at the movies. And so, you know, like a lot of, you know, like his fantasy, like, so what he you know, was delighted to be in like King Kong, for example, because he had seen a lot of King Kong movies over the years. And, you know, it was like, he grew up on like pirate movies. Uh, And so actually, uh, I don't think anyone's, I don't think he's ever been in a pirate movie. Like, I'm sure he would love that. He finally got to be in a Western, like it didn't have like a lot of sort of like the iconic sort of shootouts and so on, but he's in The Hateful Eight. And, you know, like, and it's a great part for him. And he really, so like, the, you know, he's done his Western now. Um, they, he really likes, uh, you know, sort of like uh, the horror movies. And then he finally got to um, uh, be in uh, Spiral. So you make 140 movies, you get to tick off most of the boxes as you go along. Uh, but Yeah, Six Degrees of Samuel Jackson would be. Um, yeah. <laughs> real interesting game. Um so, like the thing that both uh, Stel Pavlou and I were was su- most surprised by in the uh, in the sort of historical stuff about this book, the golf stuff. Yes. Uh, Can you talk a little about Mr. Samuel Jackson's relationship with golf? <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, growing up in uh, Chattanooga, you know, sort of like uh, golf is like the rich white man's game. You know, sort of like a. You know, he has no interest in it. Um, and but then, you know, sort of like um, uh, he uh, gets invited uh, to go out uh, by like, you know, he like gets to Hollywood and people start like asking him to go to play golf. Like Sidney Poitier asks him to uh, go play golf and, you know, sort of like, well, yes, you're going to go do this. And, you know, like he gets hooked and it, like uh, it becomes like an obsession him where, uh, you know, sort of like, he uh, has it written into his uh, contracts that, you know, sort of like whenever he's on location making a movie, you know, sort of like they, uh, the production needs to get a membership at a local um, uh, country club. And he's going to, you know, sort of have like at least like uh, two mornings a week uh, where he's going to like go to get to play golf. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, Stel Pavlou, um, uh, who on the Formula 51, like uh, said that, you know, sort of like they would be making the movie and like, okay, like he's done for the day, you know, sort of it's in uh, Liverpool, which is not that far away from Scotland. And, you know, sort of like, you know, uh, Sam would like get on a helicopter and like, okay, I can go like get in around at like St. Andrews. Uh, so um, uh, he is absolutely uh, just, it, it keys into his competitive nature. Um, uh, and it also, um, uh, because uh, Jackson was an only child, uh, like he has, you know, sort of like, he spends a lot of his life now doing the collaborative work of being in movies. But in fact, you know, he was like intensely like alone and in his own head when he was a kid, you know, he uh, said something once like if you had like a piece of candy and like he was supposed to share it with somebody, he hated that. Like, you know, sort of like, you know, if he had to break it in half, like he'd throw his half away. He couldn't take pleasure in it anymore. So I think he loves that he found, you know, sort of like a sport that, you know, sort of like, okay, there's other people around and he can be gregarious, but he is counting just on himself when he's playing golf. You know, like, and that self-reliance really means a lot to him. So. Wow. (laughs) That is a great thing to to end on. Paula, do you want to? uh, Yeah. I actually, I was getting so caught up. I lost track of time. (laughs) And, you know, I had to have a text exchange with Zach saying, oh, that's right. I got to come back in. Uh, wow, this was a lot of fun. Uh, this is so fun. fantastic. I mean, you know, great subject matter, but you two just kind of vibing over comics and Sam. 
<laughs> Does it get any better than that? I mean, perfect for Wednesday, middle of the week event, right? Thank you so much for doing that, uh, you. both of you. And congratulations on both your new releases. Which came out within a couple of weeks of each other. I'm it's glad true. we're finally That's doing perfect. it. And I can say, you know, like um, uh, Douglas's book is unbelievably wonderful. Anyone who is even a little bit into Marvel Comics or wants to be, like, should go get it. So, uh, you know, like, yeah. big thumbs and, up for me. And Gavin's book? Absolute joy, so much fun, delightful. Like if you like, if you like Samuel Jackson's movie, you're gonna like this book. Yeah. You are. And I do like that you drove home the point that um, I, it just it's laid out. The, it, it's honestly don't think of your typical biography. It's really laid out, almost like fun graphic novel. Although it's not, it it, it just I love it. Um, they did a great job with it. You did a great job, and also thank you, Gavin, for freeing me up to say this event was featuring Samuel Jackson in the book Bad Motherfucker. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I didn't know. Could I- <laughs> and as Zach pointed out, Gavin's already said it a few times. Go for it, Paul. So, just Ask for it by name. <laughs> and buy it at Book Passage by name. There's yes. By name, yes. Yeah. And we do have signed book plates by uh, Gavin. Um, so you could actually end up getting a signed first edition fun book to have for yourself or give as a gift. Also, all of the Marvels by our other guest, Douglas Wolk. Thank you both. And thank you, Book Passage audience. Until we see you again, stay safe and healthy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.